Dear followers of TheWereldMorgen.be, that's Dutch for The World Tomorrow. We are a progressive website, news site in Belgium, in the Dutch language. We are worried about the world tomorrow. We try to bring the other news, social struggle, and something that we always have stated in our publications, war cannot be understood uh, if you don't know the context and if you don't know the history. And that's why today we have the honor of having with us a historian of wars and revolutions, Jacques Powers, right. yeah. who is both Canadian and Belgian. And Belgian both. We will talk, uh, although he's also a native Dutch speaker, we will talk in the language of Shakespeare for our international audience. Jacques, welcome. Thank you very much, Robert. Jacques, uh, last year, um, about 12 months ago, we talked for you from Canada uh, via Zoom about the war in Ukraine and that moment almost a year and still on today, right. uh, sadly enough. And you gave us an overview of context and history. You, you are a historian of wars and revolutions, as is mentioned in so many publications, in so many books, articles, academic research. Now, we are a year further yep. still in this war. Yep. And negotiations are f even further away from a, mm -hmm. a realistic perspective. Uh, how did it come uh, that we are that this war is in Europe is still going on? Where are we, and uh, what are the challenges for people who want peace for peace activists today? What can you learn from that history, and what can you learn today from this war? Okay, well, there were, of course, uh, it's a pretty tough question you're asking me. It's a big question, so I wish I could answer simply in black and white, yes or no, but it's not that simple. Um, wars, uh, in general, are good for business. That's very, very important. Uh, when wars are break, up, break out, very often you have to ask cui bono, you know, who, is take, who has an advantage from this war? And here, my bias, so to speak, my, my personal view of wars like the First and Second World War, but especially the Second World War, which I've analyzed in my book on the myth of the good war, is my focus on the United States and the role of United States business, which is, of course, known as big business, you know, because the leading players are the big American corporations that we all know, the oil companies and other big, big players that are, whose names are known worldwide, Coca-Cola, General Motors, Ford, you know, IBM, ITT, they're all over the world. They're multinationals, they're not just American, but they are American, and they're, but they are multinationals, they're present everywhere. You know, the definition of multinational is a company that, that is present as business everywhere and pays taxes nowhere, maybe you've heard that before. Anyways, uh, so my focus is on the United States, and uh, that's what I'm going to necessarily focus on here today, even though I should say right away that uh, there's other countries involved as well, and are very interested uh, in the business aspects of warfare. In fact, in my book that I've just finished, uh, and that's going to be published shortly, about the French Revolution, I talk about Napoleon and how Napoleon's wars were very, very important, very good for business, for French business and how actually French businessmen, French industrialists and bankers supported Napoleon and supported his wars and in return did very well merci beaucoup because of those wars with Napoleon. In fact, uh, it's, it's kind of a Napoleon's wars that determined the, the, the further evolution of, of industrialization in France in the 19th century. You know, and that's very important and we could talk about that maybe on some other occasion. But right, let me focus here on the United States because we all know that today the war in Ukraine is, is not just a war between Russia and Ukraine. It's a war between, it's a proxy war, as we call it in English, where we have actually the United States and its allies and the, 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 the cover of NATO that are waging a proxy war against Russia via the Ukraine. In other words, it's a kind of war where the Ukrainians are the cannon fodder on behalf of a co the broad coalition led by the United States called NATO. Uh, in Canada and in Belgium, both countries for which I have citizenship, uh, are members of NATO and apparently very proud of that. You know, I myself am not so proud of <laughs> being involved in NATO. I think NATO is a criminal organization, you know, as I often say. 
because it's not involved in defensive in defending the free world it's very much involved in offensive operations and uh, that is true today as much as it was already when it was founded when NATO was founded in the in the years following World War II. We can talk about that sometime. So anyway, so I want to talk about the role of American business, especially big business, and especially the armament industry, and this whole complex in the United States of, of industry and the military establishment and the secret services that, 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 that General and later President Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex of the United States which exists, I mean, this is the real power in the United States. And uh, it's the generals in the Pentagon and the, the, the people in, in the big companies that often basically have representatives in the defense ministries and so on. They're the ones who make the real decisions because the guy who happens to live in the White House very often has no clue what's going on. That's very much the case today. That guy just reads the lines on the teleprompter that have been written for him, you know, on behalf of these anonymous gentlemen that prefer to remain anonymous, as they did already in the time of Napoleon. You know, the bankers and industrialists behind the wars, they prefer to remain anonymous. They prefer that you think of these leaders being the, the ones who decide it all, who are responsible for both the good and the bad that happens in wars. You know, the bad is always, of course, the other guys and the good, that, that's us. And, so, the, and the ideals that they sort of and the ideals, yes. So, so this war is very much about business, and it's very much about the business of American big business. It's a very, very much a war uh, that's about in, that focuses on the business of the American industrial military industrial complex. And in this respect, then you may say, well, what 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 good is that war f for them? Well, the answer is it's been wonderful so far, uh, and that's one of the reasons why they started it. Because the war didn't start last year, it started in 2014, when essentially, you know, you might say it was provoked, but we won't get into that. You asked me to talk about the situation today. And essentially, the war generates fantastic business in, in many, many ways. First of all, war is, is, involves a lot of very expensive, very sophisticated, very modern, and very you know, high technology, high tech equipment. You know, from, from radars and for cannons and, uh, and surveillance equipment and you know you name it of course machine guns and all that stuff and at the same time it destroys it which means that you have to order new stuff right and we've now recently have been witnessing how lots of NATO countries are sending weapons to the Ukraine and no sooner have they arrived than the Russians destroyed them right? well that's good for business because it means they need more and then they come the Ukraine is basically basically broke but we have also bankers in the Western world who want to give them money, loan them money, so they can buy from us. A lot of the money that is, so to speak, given by the United States and other Western countries to Ukraine doesn't leave the banks in New York or Washington, or for that matter, Brussels. No, it's just credit for the Ukrainians to use to buy what we sell, all right? So that war, it basically, it consumes the products which American industry produces and it's about the only thing they produce these days. The rest of all is produced in China or Taiwan or wherever, right? And it's a very, very profitable business, right? And just it can keep on cranking it out, and thank God there's a war. Because imagine now, for example, if peace would break out tomorrow, all these weapon producers in the United States, and that's the, the big business of American industry, they would have nothing to sell anymore. There'd be peace in the world. Imagine that. It'd be like Christmas every day. You know, you can't have that. That'd be very, very bad for the people who produce these cruise missiles and, and, and cannon and you name it, right, and airplanes and so forth. So the war is good for that. And it doesn't matter when you look at it that way if that war ends with a victory or not. I mean, ideally, in a war, you, you prefer to win. But in a way, it's not necessary. Or well, you might want it to last. Well, exactly. Perpetual war. Permanent warfare is actually what we are, what we are presently witness, witnessing. But let me take the example of the war in Afghanistan, in which Cairo was involved as well, sent troops to Afghanistan. It lasted 20 years. I think it's the longest war in American history. And ended with a pretty shameful defeat, if you think about it. I mean, here's the biggest, most powerful country in the world, basically beaten by a bunch of you know, a bunch of people living in caves, you know, in the mountains in Central Asia somewhere. You know, come on, you know. It's pretty shameful, but you know, no matter, because that war for 20 years generated an enormous amount of business and therefore enormous profits for the shareholders of the big companies of the military industrial complex. 
And then you have to keep in mind that a warfare is a way to re redistribute the wealth. Up, upwards. Exactly. When we hear about redistribution of the wealth, being, being nice and kind people, we think that the rich who have too much already dis distribute, redistribute a bit you know, to help the poor. Trickle well, down. warfare is a way to do it the other way around. It's a perverse opposite. It's a redistribution of the wealth from the poor to the rich. And the reason for that is that all these, this money that the American government and NATO member countries and the European Union make available to the, you know, to, 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 uh, to the Ukrainian government to buy weapons. That means the profits go to the very investors, the people with a lot of money, who are basically the owners of the military uh, businesses that are, that are providing the goods and selling and making all the money. But the cost of it goes to every single American, essentially, every single citizen. So essentially, it's the little guys that contribute and make the money available you know, to go via the weapons per, per manufacturers, you know, and backed into the pockets, books of the people who are the shareholders mm -hmm. in those big companies that make the money. So that's in that respect, then, war is wonderful. And it doesn't really matter if it ends with a victory. In fact, it would be very bad if victory would come too quickly. In fact, in fact, it's not even a problem if victory doesn't come, as in the war with, with, with Afghanistan. There was no victory. It didn't matter. It was 20 darn good years for business. And then when that war is over, it's like in France in the old days, le roi mort, vive le roi. It's like the war is over, long live the new war. You know, the war in the Middle East is over, okay then, war in Ukraine. When war in Ukraine ends, and eventually it will come to an end, you know, then I'm sure there'll be another war sometime soon somewhere else and there's lots of countries that, that qualify you know on the other side of the continent well there's there's all kinds of possibilities there could be another war in the middle east of course that's always a, lots of opportunities over there there could be a war sometimes obviously against china but um, yeah there's could be there's a lot of opportunities for war in fact one of the things that I write in one of my books about george w bush who was one of the most in many ways incompetent presidents the united states has ever had but his big merit from the perspective that I just described is that he arranged for, uh, he, brought in, he brought about under his auspices, he didn't do anything, under his auspices, they came up with the idea of permanent warfare worldwide. You know, because it's all against terrorism. And terrorism, that is an abstract concept. It's not, terrorism isn't going to come out one day and wave the white flag and say we surrender. No, terrorism is going to be with us forever. So that means war against terrorism is perpetual warfare. Everywhere and anywhere in the world, you know, against whoever we say is a terrorist, you know, perhaps that guy, perhaps you, you know, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. you know. So that way we can actually constantly justify the huge expenditures, zillions, trillions of dollars that are spent on the on, 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 on weapons production, because that's very profitable. When I remember, I'm old enough to remember the end of the Cold War in 1990, and at that stage, United States, the people in all over the world expected what was called the peace dividend. The idea was that now finally we could stop spending all that money on weapons and do something for ordinary people. You know, for, for example, put in place decent public transportation systems, improve education, improve finally a healthcare. decent healthcare system. And everybody said, oh, that's going to be great. Well, excuse moi you know, that didn't happen. Why not? Well, there's no money in it for the industrial, military industrial complex. I mean, how can you make money by just building kindergartens? You know, for, Come on, you know, or, or bus lines to, to get people to get cheaply into town. It, it doesn't pay. Warfare is very, very profitable. And that's why we have war. That's one of the reasons why we have war. There is, however, uh, a basic contradiction in this uh, model that is something that's being paid by the middle class. But at, the, uh, at this moment, the United States middle class is, is dwindling, is disappearing. So the basis to pay all this with taxes uh, some parts, world. some parts of the U.S. in the South, especially, yes. are basically third world, uh, yes. third world country. Right. And uh, the, the the question is, how long is this system going to be uh -huh. able to 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 keep going at this yeah. rate, yeah. Uh, consuming all the energy of a country yeah. for warfare elsewhere? Mm -hmm. I mean, because there's also the fact that war, you can only wage war if there is a conflict a real conflict somewhere that you then 
uh, put oil on the fire to make it worse because we cannot deny that there was a conflict in yeah. Ukraine, yeah. etc. So there are two things. First of all, war needs a, a, a reason to be yes. somewhere. And secondly, at the same time, this complex mm -hmm. is at the in the long term undermining its own That's financial right. basis. Okay. Well, my friend, who is unfortunately no longer very active, Michael Parenti, has talked in that context of the third worldization of the United States, yes. meaning how the third the United States is becoming a third world country in many ways. The infrastructure crumbling. Is, is crumbling, exactly. And uh, we in Canada are not quite as badly off, but I mean, it's, we have, in many ways it's we're going the same route. When I consider the railways in Canada, how poorly we are served, even though some Canadian railways are famous, they look good in pictures, the railways to the Rocky Mountains and all that stuff. But for example, to go from where I live, like 100 kilometers from Toronto, by train to Toronto, there's a train line. It's first of all, it's very slow and the delays and it's, the equipment is 19th century essentially, and it's filthy expensive, because it's privatized. So people just can't, can't afford it, and the, the trains don't run when you want to go. There's one in the morning, and then, then the, the, after that it's gone, finished, you know. Not like here in Belgium where the trains go every half hour from Ghent or Bruges to, to Brussels. It goes once in, once in a while, and it's very, very expensive. So what happens, people drive their cars, you know, millions of cars on the expressways. So, so yes, indeed, this program, this, the, this perpetual warfare, this permanent warfare system, the warfare systems it's called, it leads to a further popularization of the American population and a general third worldization, as Michael Parenti has called it, of the country. And that is indeed a major, major issue. It is indeed one part of America becoming richer and richer, the 1%, and the 99% becoming poorer and poorer. That is one of the contradictions of capitalism, as Marx pointed out. I mean, you can only grab so much from people and eventually, you know, they, 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 there's no more grabbing to be done. But you know what? Uh, there is more grabbing to be done. The United States, at one point, in, in the context which I describe in my book, The Myth of the Good War, did increase wages considerably of working class, the working class, the workmen in the United States, namely during the war, during the Second World War. And that also made, made for a prosperous middle class. And in the years following the Second World War, when there was a need to compete with the countries, the communist countries, the, so the Soviet bloc, you know, the, the, the good times, the les trente glorieuses années, as the French call it, did continue. So there, so there was a, a fair amount, a great amount of wealth built up, you know, in a middle class and in a hardworking, prosperous working class, you know, so that there was, there's a, was a pool of money there, and that's the one that's being depleted. And that's indeed, we're getting perilously close to, to basically emptying it. And that money has all been you know, basically, you know, has percolated to the top. And of course, these people invest their money wherever, where there's no taxes to be paid. I was not so long ago in the Cayman Islands in the Caribbean, and it's like New York City in, in, the, in the Caribbean. Very few black people to be seen. They're all rich bankers who live there, and the hotels, the restaurants, is all like wonderful. It's very, very, very expensive. And that's where the money is. Because that's where these multinationals who want to avoid paying taxes here in Belgium or other stinky little countries, you know, they want to just they go there because there they pay 1%. And that's good enough for the Cayman Island government to, to do very well, thank you very much. It also means that here they pay no money, no taxes, because there's always bills coming in from the headquarters in the Cayman Islands to say, sorry, you owe us. So I'm sorry, Mr. Belgian government, ITT here or IBM didn't make any money or Amazon or good because we just got a bill for, you know, for, well, you wouldn't understand, but, you know, we have to pay our the company in, in somewhere else and they'll pay the taxes over there, right? So you're out of luck. Yeah, but what you do is make a deeper analysis yes. of the reasons of war in general. Yes. Now, uh, NATO narrative is very simple. All what you have been saying, uh, Jacques, is, is uh, irrelevant because we wouldn't have had that war if Russia did not invade Ukraine. How do you respond to that argument? Well, we need, we need bad guys. To fight wars, you need, you cannot simply say to the public, okay folks, I'm sorry, but we, we need to increase our, our profit margins here, and so we need a war. And you know what, we've picked a stupid little country somewhere, for example, Libya, and we're gonna bomb the hell out of them, you know, and, uh, and we'll just do it because we, we like to do it to make money. No, you gotta, you gotta say we're gonna bomb the hell out of Libya, 
because there's a bad guy there, who, who a really, really bad guy, and he's buying weapons of mass destruction, you know. <laughs> so we can't have that. So I'm sorry, we have to kill. You know, we have to invade the country. That's the pretext that was used by Tony Blair and by George W. Bush to invade, for example, Iraq, as George W. Bush called it. You know, there's always a, an, an easy reason. Later on, it turned out that there were no weapons of mass destruction. Well, uh, sorry. <laughs> you know, so on the next show, let's you know, and now it's, it's, it's Russia. But in Canada, we constantly hear that the war, that, that Putin started that war last year, and it was unprovoked, unprovoked, unprovoked. In English, there's a saying called, thou protests too much. You know, there's a bit too much protesting here. In other words, there may be something onto what is being said about you know, it being provoked. You, have, you don't have to repeat all the time, unprovoked, until, unless you really probably know that it was provoked. And it was provoked. That war was provoked. Russia was push, pushed with its back against the wall. And the, the analysis is, is quite, or the way to explain that is rather simple. There was, in 1960-something, the Russians basically were, had every right to install missiles in Cuba because the Cuban government allowed it, as the Turkish government allowed the American government to install missiles in Turkey on the border of Russia. But when the Russians did the same thing and installed missiles in Cuba, there was an outcry against it. And in Washington, it was perceived as a, an existential threat, having Russian missiles right there at our doorstep in an unfriendly country, a little neighbor country, doesn't matter, unfriendly Cuba. Right? Even though there was nothing in international law that prohibits these two countries, who are sovereign, to make an arrangement whereby the one is allowed to install his military equipment in my country, as Turkey did, you know, allowing American missiles in Turkey. And Belgium, nuclear bombs here, you know, and not far from here, in Limburg, right? I mean, they're there, and in Holland also has these bombs, and no, under no control of the Belgian government at all, right? Anyway, so that, Russia had every right to do that, and Cuba had every right to do that. But we all understand very well, and we sympathize immediately with the fact that the Americans perceive that as an existential threat. And therefore, we sympathize with Kennedy when he said, absolutely no way, we got to stop that nonsense. And we came that close to nuclear war you know, for the principle that America did not want to be threatened. Well, on a program on TV in Canada recently, a, a listener called in and asked that question of a lady from some institute in Vienna who was condemning Putin for being you know, an unprovoked you know, attack on, on, the, on the Ukraine. And that, that listener or the spectator that called in asked us exactly, isn't it the situation? of Russia, similar to the one United States, whereby the advances of the advance of NATO to the Russian borders in Estonia, Latvia, Poland, and Ukraine, and now, uh, sorry, and, and Romania, and now in Ukraine, you know, isn't that similarly an existential threat to Russia, right? And she immediately started talking about something totally different. And I, I am so upset with the moderator that he didn't say, excuse me, would you mind answering the question? because she totally avoided that question because she had no answer for it. It was indeed, it was indeed the advance, the idea that would, they would make that Ukraine would become a member of NATO, which is an aggressive alliance, not a defensive alliance, you know, was, was an existential threat to, 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 to Russia. And that's where Putin, in a way, you know, could have and arguably should have responded already in 2014. And instead, he waited. And then the, the, one of the reasons why <coughs> the, the Ukrainians are putting up a pretty tough resistance today, although we can argue about that, you know, is that in that intervening time since 2014 until last year, we have been arming the Ukrainians to the teeth. And Canada itself has been sending troops to train them and, and to work them. So time was against the Russians. You know, if they would have waited more, much longer so that Ukraine would become even, have even more weapons and then join NATO, then the, their option of military, the kind of military action you know, to defend themselves you know, in, an, un, in a non-provoked warfare, which countries have the right to do, by the way, by international law, you know, that window would have closed. And that is why Putin was, in a sense, forced to act. I think, looking back at the history of what's happened in the last 10 years in Ukraine, that Putin has had a lot of patience, a lot of patience. I mean, a lot of people that I know have been following much more closely than I have the situation of Ukraine and, and the relations with Russia have been exasperated 
that Putin didn't really react more strongly. He kept saying our American friends and our American partners and so on, when it was quite obvious that the Americans did not consider him as a friend or a partner. And this reads a question then, why Russia? Yeah. There is something about this war which has another dimension, but there's not a dimension to this war than just the making money kind of side of it, which is very, very important. But another side of it is the idea of Russia as a country that refuses to be subordinated by the United States. And in this world, in this post-World War II world, out of which other, a world which was created by the Second World War, out of which the United States came as the major superpower with only one competitor, the Soviet Union, which it then eliminated in the Cold War. So that by 1990, the United States became the number one power in the world. It was a unipolar world. The hegemon. The hegemon, right? Total full spectrum dominance is really what seemed to be a reality at that stage, right? And what's his name wrote a book about that, how the end of history, how now, look at the, we're set for the rest of our history now, you know, the United States are it, right? And it's always going to be that way. Well, so many years later now, 30 so many years later, it's not like that anymore. It's no longer a unipolar world. And that's a problem. However, it's a problem for the hegemon, you know. And it's a problem in many ways. One is also that, that the, this, your vassals, your so-called partners, but they're really vassals, your are getting a little allies. are getting a little restless. And if you're the hegemon in the imperialist world, it's a it's a jungle out there, as the saying goes, right? It's a jungle out there. The the, the idea is to feed off wherever the feeding is good. And this brings you back to the issue of the third worldization uh, of the United States itself. The, basically, this warfare system has involved basically ripping off the lower classes, the middle classes, which is now disappearing, and the ordinary working class in the United States. And there was a reserve of wealth, as I argued, that could be tapped, and it's now disappearing. But a war like this allows for the United States military industrial complex to also suck the wealth out of you little Belgians and the Dutch and the Germans. That's a rich country. A rich country that can be plundered, squeezed like a lemon, and that's exactly what's been happening. Look what's happening in Germany. Germany is basically is experiencing a major economic crisis now. And it's a crisis that is in many ways related to that war. And not so much because the Russians are coming, no, it's actually because the Americans are there already and are making it more difficult. You know, that Nord Stream pipeline was blown up by the Americans, everybody knows that. Except that we don't want to know it, we don't want to know it. The Rus why would the Russians blow up a pipeline that they built to supply, to sell their oil to a willing customer yes. Germany. I mean, hello. And if you look at these videos where you hear all these these big shots of the American establishment saying years ago already, including Biden, that that pipeline, we will destroy that pipeline. So now they did the pretend, oh no, we didn't do it. Or first of all, Putin did it himself, which is absurd. And now we blame it on the, on the Ukrainians, so to speak. Well, that's absurd too, because they don't have the technology to know how to do that. The Norwegians do, and the British do, and the Americans do. And it's in the Baltic, it's in the neck of the woods, so to speak. So they've done that. But what I'm saying is, what we're seeing is a deindustrialization of, of Germany. And uh, the lack, the, uh, the, the fact that, that cheap, relatively cheap um, gas from Russia will not be feeding American industry, will force the Americans to buy liquid the gas Germans, elsewhere yeah. at high prices. Yeah. So, so the war, this war now, is good for American business because it now opens up the prospect of squeezing money out of Germany and pauperizing the German middle class and the German working class. Now there's not a possibility. There's a possibility. That should be good for another 10, 20 years of warfare and continuing exploitation, right? Jacques, there's so much more to be said, there is. Uh, but our time is limited. I thank you for your uh, analysis. This is certainly not the last time that we're going to talk about it. Uh, I would like to point out to you, our viewers, that Jack has a prolific writer, many, many books that I would really advise. Uh, we are the world Morgan. We offer you this news uh, for free, but you're always invited to support us or to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Thank you.